Kia ora everyone, good evening and welcome to what we are calling the official unofficial launch of the election campaign, hopefully raising the bar um, from the gutter and keeping it up there for the duration of the campaign, if we can get buy-in from, from everybody, um, with a thoughtful, thought-provoking debate. Um, I'm Toby O'Brien, I'm News Hub's political editor. Uh, we've got a bit of housekeeping to get through as well, but first I just want to thank our hosts. Thank you very much to the New Zealand Institute for International Affairs and the Council for International Development. Thanks to our sponsors, the Asia New Zealand Foundation and Pacific Cooperation Foundation. The housekeeping matters, if you hear a fire alarm, uh, make your way out of the room, down the stairs, either across the road to the coffee shop or to post office square. If there is an earthquake, stay where you are. We're assured that this is the safest place that we could possibly be and drop, cover, hold, wait for instructions. We'll be told what to do thereafter. There will be nibbles and drinks afterwards, so please stick around um, and continue the debate. Um, we have, these guys have got plans to catch some of them, so we're gonna get pretty swiftly into it. Um, but there is an opportunity for you to all ask questions as well on Slido. And I think that the instructions are going to go up on the screens behind us how to do that. So submit questions, the most popular questions, we'll ask those at the end of the debate. <coughs> uh, welcome again to the official unofficial launch of the election campaign. Uh, New Zealanders have plenty of reasons to feel pride and relief over the way we've handled COVID-19. But what comes next? We can't keep our borders closed indefinitely, please, Minister. Uh, how much longer can New Zealand remain a COVID-free oasis and still trade and create new jobs? There are foreign policy implications as well. Will New Zealand be forced to pick sides between China and the United States? The Pacific wants a bubble. Famines are on the rise around the world. How can we remain a respected voice on global issues shut off from the world? And if we're entering a new era of localism, as nations turn inwards, is globalisation itself on the ropes? And is it worth salvaging? Uh, to answer all of these questions and then some, I'm joined by leading spokespeople from all of the political parties, starting down the end there, James Shaw, the Green Party co-leader who's stepping in tonight for Gauri's Garaman, who unfortunately pulled out at the last minute. Um, David Parker, one of Labour's ministers for everything, including trade <laughs> and export growth. <laughs> Fletcher Tabato, thank you very much from New Zealand First, standing up for Winston Peters tonight, though are we hoping that he's going to be a, a ring-in at some point? 625. 625, <laughs> when you post your plane. Probably a good thing he's not here he after listening to James Shaw's de adjournment speech this evening. Some volleys. We shook hands immediately after. <laughs> <laughs> was, you softened the blow throughout. Um, Simon Bridges, National's former leader and now spokesperson for Foreign Affairs, and David Seymour, the ACT Party leader and spokesperson for everything <laughs> act, act party related. <coughs> uh, there is a lot to get through. I'm going to address questions. I raised this with you guys before, but address questions to each of you. If there is something that you feel particularly passionate about and want to pipe up on, feel free to do so. Likewise, if you pipe up for too long, prepare to be uh, piped down again. <laughs> we're going to start with, so we're, the, the, um, the, the title of tonight's debate gives you a clue as to how we're doing it. We're going to chunk it into three pieces. We're going to start with diplomacy, move into aid, and then trade. China is asserting itself with renewed aggression across the world, especially in our region. Meanwhile, the United States is retreating from its global role. David Parker, you pull rank here on this, um, on this stage. So where should we draw, draw the line on China before we rethink our current relationship? Crushing democracy in Hong Kong, Uyghur concentration camps, where do we draw the line? Um, well, carefully. Um, um, actually, speaking to an audience, and I suspect my fellow panellists feel the same, there's more uh, competency on the other side of this <laughs> debate than there is on the, at least speaking for myself, shouldn't insult my fellow panellists. Um, uh, we approach these, uh, these uh, events issue by issue. Um, uh, we try to uh, maintain our independent voice in the world. Um, and we've been pretty successful at that through the years, partly because we rest on the uh, truth that we were willing to fall out with the USA standing up for our principles on nuclear issues. Uh, we try, it's almost expected of us that we will uh, maintain that independent foreign policy which creates the space for us to do so. And so, you know, uh, Prime Minister recently was speaking to a China business forum in Auckland Simon was there, I was there, uh, and 
as Prime Ministers and Prime Ministers have. She emphasised things that are uncomfortable to state uh, but need to be sent to, um, to uh, China in respect of uh, Uyghurs or most recently Hong Kong. Uh, so um, we deal with those on issues by issue basis according to our own values. And I'm interested actually, Simon, to hear your view on this as well as the, the representative of the, the largest political party. Where do we draw the line? Look, I think in truth, the National Party's positions evolved because the facts have changed. And uh, I, I wanted this portfolio and make no secret about it because I just think we were at an incredibly important time. I think Wood's become more interesting, it's become more uncertain, and frankly, it's become more dangerous. And I think top of the list of issues the world's got right at the moment, indeed, let's be quite blunt about it, in the lead up to the US elections in November, um, is the China-US relationship. Um, I think it's um, deeply concerning. And, uh, you know, I also think it's um, perhaps not said so often in diplomatic circles, but it's also, frankly, obvious China is being more aggressive. Uh, and that's whether it's around Hong Kong and the national security law, that's whether it's Uyghur people, uh, that's whether it's on the Indian border, there are just a range of issues. And so I think for New Zealand, yes, I, I don't disagree with anything that David said. We've got an independent policy in this area. Um, we clearly have a strong relationship in trade, but in people-to-people -people links and so on. But we also, on the other side of it, will straightforwardly condemn, I think, the things we see uh, that are wrong and the Hong Kong national security uh, law is one of those uh, things. On, on that, James, do you, what will our relationship be like with Hong Kong now? Well, I, I mean, obviously we're still trading. There's still a lot of um, exchange going on, on with Hong Kong, but it is also clear that um, the Beijing government is you know, exerting greater and greater control uh, over, over the government of Hong Kong. And, you know, recently, um, the Right Honourable and Prime Minister and Foreign Minister you know, made that move saying that we were going to pull out of the extradition treaty. They then said that they would do the same, which was merely a mutual parting of ways on that front. Um, I, think, I, mean, I think the context, though, is you know, when you talk about the US retreating, uh, it definitely has, obviously, but I think that that will be temporary. The odds are that you'll have a change of administration that is likely to take a more assertive role with China. China's definitely pushing the boundaries at the moment, um, both within its own territory and outside its own, own territory. And you can see that sort of real politic of wanting to take strategic advantage of the situation. Um, but I think if the US counterbalances, you might see a return to the uh, kind of relationship that they had prior, and most notably through the cooperation that led to the Paris Agreement, where whilst they were competitors that there was a, a sort of a relationship more of more of equals um, so I think actually China's stance depends to an enormous extent on the US stance uh, and and um, you know where we navigate the way through that has to be extremely extremely careful but I don't think that we should ever lose our values in that and, and until then um, Fletcher you were nodding your head when Simon was talking about that growing aggression do you think that we should ban Huawei like the United States United Kingdom and Australia have in terms of um, building the 5G network? I think for everyone on the stage, the, um, the issue there isn't so much about politicians making that call. I think everyone in the room will understand that actually we take uh, technical advice from the experts on the security uh, components of uh, the Huawei components going into our networks and they um, actually um, give us formal advice that we actually act on. So no sway, not a pressure from the Five Eyes Alliance? Uh, Simon and David have said it. We have to set our independent course, maintain that, be seen as independent, and making decisions uh, that affect uh, our relationship with the rest of the world in a way that is transparent and um, that can be seen that way. David Seymour, I know you've um, been champing at the bit to get, get into this part of the conversation. Oh, um, our security <laughs> needs diverging from our trade interests. What's more important? Our membership of that Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance or our trading interests with China? Look, ultimately it's Five Eyes and I agree with what everyone said about the, the Uyghur issue, about Hong Kong. I, I think that is seriously concerning. But I'm more worried about the stuff that's happening here. So you look last June, um, Derek Cormack, the VC of AUT, gets a call from the embassy saying, would, would rather you didn't commemorate the Tiananmen Square incident. And Derek Cormack says, no problem, we don't have any space anywhere. 
I mean, has anyone been to the Wellesley campus of AUT? It's huge. Um, and I think that actually the situation AUT found itself in there is a microcosm of the situation that our whole country is in. Uh, and I think that is very scary. So there's, there's no points for being chicken little. But I think we should be worried about that. And I also think that what's happening with China is actually a, a smaller version of what is happening globally. So, you know, 15 years ago, as a liberal, I could say, look, we won, the commies lost, it's all free markets, free trade and civilization from here, and it was. But over the last 15 years, you look at the amount of political rights and civil liberties from your Freedom House and, and your other uh, indices, the UN and so on, it's all going backwards. China is just the biggest example of it, that you've got very liberal people who managed to run very prosperous free market economies. And I think the mistake we've made is that we said, look, come into the WTO, if we trade with you, you'll become like us. It hasn't worked. And we now need to start asserting our democratic and liberal values a lot more aggressively, just as illiberal people are asserting theirs. I think the world's become a lot less comfortable than it was, and we need to wake up to that super quick. And if I just make a couple of, I think, related policy points on the China-US stuff. I mean, I think one is, um, if you look, uh, whether it's the United Kingdom, whether it's Australia, other countries as well, um, they've been quite clear on this idea of a safe haven visa. I think it's something we should be um, uh, certainly considering. Um, not in the numbers that the United Kingdom with historic relationship with Hong Kong is considering, but I think it would be both right in terms of our values, but also in terms of the skills we want to attract. I think the other thing is if you look quite clearly in Australia, and it's a bipartisan issue it seems to me largely, uh, between both Penny Wong and the, the, the Liberal National uh, Party over there, they are quite clear about deepening their relationships with whatever you want to call them, third powers, middle countries in the Indo-Pacific, and indeed the EU. And it just seems to me that's something that whatever happens after the election, a New Zealand government should be doing with the likes of India, Japan, um, Indonesia, Vietnam, um, all of the EU, and I, I think it requires a very proactive, um, energetic stance. Um, that, that, dare I say it, David, don't be too critical, but I don't know that. You've been a bit preoccupied, I grant that, um, this year, but I, I don't know we have seen quite sufficiently over the last three years. Uh, right of reply there, David. Oh, patently not true. I don't need to reply. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 on, on, the, on, on US and China, what, what if we do need to pick sides? David Parker. Uh, well, um, I'm not going to pick sides. Someone else here might want to, but that's not our position. We're not going to. You know, there's plenty uh, to criticise out there in the world and in respect of a lot of countries, not just uh, China that's been the focus of your question, and I think we approach those, uh, those issues one by one. We also uh, uh, can never do these things alone, which is why we put so much weight on our membership of uh, multilateral institutions, and it's true but those institutions are not nearly as effective as they used to be. They seem to be blocked through sort of hostage taking on both sides of the debate with this breakdown of, of civility between uh, different sides of uh, discussions caused in no small part actually by social media, if you want one of the root causes of all this, um, and their, you know, their irresponsibility and the lack of any consequence for but, it. Tova, just on the picking sides issue, I mean, if you look at the manoeuvres last week, um, Beijing said, we are going to give New Zealand a chance to reconsider its position on extradition with Hong Kong. I mean, they deliberately said, are you sure you want to go with the Five Eyes? Pick a side. And I think, unfortunately, uh, it's not good enough to say, well, I'm not going to pick a side, because, uh, you know, as I said, the, the world the we world's didn't got... have to. We just had to take a decision well, for ourselves on extradition, I, which I, we took. I, we did, but, but I mean, they, they made it very clear. And, 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 but, but to give you a, a sense of the complication, look at Australia right now. Well, they have been clearly more, use the word you want, but robust than New Zealand when it comes to China for a long time. This year, they've been incredibly uh, robust. The other side of it is their trade has just gone to higher than ever with China. You know, they now have more dependence. Sorry, uh, Madam Ambassador, but it's true. Um, uh, more dependent on China than they've ever been in the past. And that just shows you, look, frankly, the issues we're dealing with here. So can I address what Simon was kind of accusing uh, us of in terms of <laughs> not engaging? Uh, the last trip I had was uh, into Europe uh, doing political level FTA negotiations with the EU. And actually what we're seeing in terms of the America-China um, kind of dichotomy and uh, people around, countries around the world 
are aware that it's destabilising and it's actually, for New Zealand, creating a, a conversation which means that we have a lot more in common with these small to mid-sized economies that want that stability, that want those multilateral systems, that want to engage with one another. And actually, we've progressed um, down that path quite a long way. And um, actually, the Minister's work in the trade space in terms of um, access and um, export markets has been uh, an indication of how far we have gone to maintain that level of stability. One, one of the reasons we have this anxiety uh, and we end up in this either or conversation is because um, after the China FTO was signed, we tended to hyper concentrate our trade with one partner. Um, and we've been here before, you know, uh, with the EU and, you know, getting tipped out of that uh, relationship in, in the 70s. And I think um, the safest bet um, is to continue to try and diversify our um, export mm. partners. Mm. Uh, because that way you're not Why reliant you on, on relationships. Eh? Why didn't you vote for CPTPP? Because <laughs> <laughs> we had concerns with the nature of the well, deal. I think yeah, the, 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 the CP <laughs> makes all of the difference. <laughs> it does. It does. Right? We're, so, we're, we'll, we'll move on to trade. <laughs> We'll move on to trade a bit more, um, in a bit more mm. concentrated fashion shortly, gentlemen. But if, if you win in September, Simon, perhaps I'll address this to you because you touched on it before. How are you going to deal with the leaders of the biggest nations from India, Brazil, the United States and the United Kingdom turning, and this you know, maybe goes back to your original point, but turning inwards away from multilateralism? Well, I, th I think you're right. There is a bit of that. But look, you just got to get out there. And mm. that's both in our interests and it's also, uh, I think, um, uh, in terms of our values, the right thing to do. I mean, I went to India at the end of last year. It was a... A really eye-opening trip for me, actually. I just, um, you know, 28 states, over a billion people. Yep, uh, I'm not at any level denying uh, the heroic task that getting an FTA or even something remotely approaching that would be. But I think both for trade reasons, but also for geopolitical politics, we just got to get out there and push into the likes of, of um, ASEAN uh, and other uh, multilateral organisations. Do you, do you agree with that, Minister? I do, yeah. And COVID-19 is, uh, is set to reverse 30 years of poverty reduction. The United mm. Nations estimates that 800 million people globally may go hungry this year. James Shaw, what's New Zealand's role as a good global citizen? Um, well, I mean, under our... So I have to wear two hats here, right? So on one hand, I've got to uphold the government line. On the other hand, I'm also the Green Party spokesperson. It's the whole so campaign. On the, on the one hand. Oh, no, I'm just hard to just finish. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, go for it. Gloves are off. I'm still part of the history. So he's just working with the Labour Party right there. The, the, when you get 4.8 percent, you will regret that, my friend. Go for it. It always comes through two weeks later. The uh, the work that we've done uh, to expand our uh, aid program significantly over the course of the last three years uh, is really important. I think that the next part of that is actually around debt relief. Um, and you are seeing a shift uh, at MFAT um, and uh, around the world people are, you know, the, the kind of main institutions are starting to say actually that, that is the route that we need to go down. And I think particularly in the light of the impact of COVID-19 um, and particularly the weaponisation of debt by some players, uh, then you, you know that, that that would be the next the next boundary that I would push is to say, well, you know, let's um, work with the international community to start to alleviate some of that debt so that people can actually use um, what income they do have on things that are important. I think that's a, quite a nice segue into aid in the Pacific, which is our second segment. Fletcher, uh, I know your boss is very proud of his record on on aid, but. We only spend about 0.3% of our gross national income when the recommended level is 0.7%. So will the levels, if you're in a position to have any say, will the levels stay the same? Could they drop off? Will you increase aid? Well, let's put that in context. Uh, when we took over, it was at 0.22. It's now at 0.33. That's $200 million per annum increase. That was initially just over $700 million uh, increase in our... Um, our aid commitment, and, we'll and the, main, going up. the main focus of that was the Pacific, that's our neighbourhood, that's our people, that's our cousins, and our intent is for that to continue to go up. And I would um, preempt probably the question then directed at us, is that the right use of New Zealand's money? And my argument would be absolutely. So I was at a um, Pacific Island Minister's event, and a minister 
uh, Deputy Prime Minister Brown from the Cook Islands made it very clear that a dollar spent now uh, in the Pacific in terms of resilience is eight dollars saved in the future. And there's no way anyone on this stage or in this room, I presume, would um, at any time in the future say no to uh, supporting and um, continuing to invest in the Pacific. He also made some quite bold statements about um, bubbles, which we'll get to shortly, as, <laughs> shortly as well. Um, I meant to mention earlier as well, we've got a couple of great cameo appearance video questions, and we're going to go to one now, uh, taking a question from the former Director General of the Pacific Community, now at uh, Auckland University, Dr Colin Tokuitonga. Okay. Kia ora, I'm Colin Tokuitonga, Associate Professor of Public Health at the University of Auckland. I would like to ask why we have not put in place a New Zealand realm country travel uh, bubble. The risk of introducing COVID into the islands from New Zealand is remote, and the risk of introducing COVID into New Zealand from the islands is remote. And there are sound economic and family reasons as to why we should have a New Zealand realm country bubble at this time. David Parker? Um, well, the realm country case is easier perhaps than the rest of the Pacific. Um, it's part, so easy, why haven't we done it? Why haven't we here? <laughs> uh, because Australia actually wanted us to have a bubble with them first. And, uh, so? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll know Fair if you're point. in government. Uh, and we thought that was an appropriate priority given their wish. I thought you just told us we had an independent foreign policy. We do. We have the ability to decide that independently, and we did. Um, we thought that was an appropriate wish. Uh, we were, through that, also negotiating on behalf of our desire to extend it to realm countries. It hasn't gone well in Australia recently, or as well as they would have hoped. Uh, we are now pivoting to look at those issues for realm countries. Um, um, it, it's very easy to say it's easy, but it's not that easy. Um, You've got to be very careful uh, about every stage of it. Um, and if it were that easy, why is it that other countries that are COVID-free in the Pacific don't want those linkages? So um, uh, uh, those issues are under consideration, and when it's safe to do so, it'll work. What, it, what is safe to do so? Is it, is it a matter of, is it that we're most concerned about exporting COVID to those countries? And, and, and when is it safe to do so? I, I, think, I think it's both. Uh, um, you know, we're, we're learning every week, you know, those most recent cases that went to Australia and uh, Korea where people were found to have COVID when they arrived, having come from or through New Zealand. It's not 100% clear where they got it yet. It's almost certain that they didn't get it from, uh, well it is certain so far as on all the information we've got that it wasn't community transmission in New Zealand, but they may have got it in the airport as they passed through New Zealand. So if you're going to have people coming in and out of our airports, you have to make sure that all of those issues are worked through so that there's not cross-transmission as people pass each other in airports, for example. National so would probably argue, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the reason we can't have these things is because we haven't sorted our quarantines and our borders enough. That was certainly the line your leader was Yeah, running. look, I think there's a bit of that. I mean, I think fundamentally, um, there's nothing I hear from David to disagree with, but I think, you know, it can be done safely. Let's get on to the likes of the Cooks, uh, Nui, those realm uh, 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 nations. Um, and then actually let's see a plan for more than that. Let's think about other countries where we can do this really safely, uh, not, not in a cavalier way. Um, and let's also be thinking about how we can do it the other way. And you know, when I hear things like the city rail link um, needs a, a certain skilled worker, they just can't get it in, I just think it's a no-brainer we should be doing that. By the way, let me try and spike the announcement next week. I understand we're announcing the Cooks, David, on Monday, and I look forward to that. Damn. <laughs> Please yeah, write yeah. a reply on that one, Mr. As always, you know more than me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I'm wrong right. Monday. You hear it here first. Jacinda's probably moving it to Tuesday just because of that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you put five bucks on it, Minister? No, I, I won't. Um, I, I stopped taking bets the day that Donald Trump was elected president. <laughs> <laughs> but I, Likewise. I, um, but I, I, you know, I think on this, I mean, it. it you can see it only takes one case, right? And, and in our own case, we've had thousands and thousands of people quarantined. And then every few days, we get a runner. You know, someone jumps a fence or finds a way out, or, you know, does something like that. 
um, which is dumb, but out of, no, but yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah. if you t look at thousands, yeah. like we're putting them up in hotels, not prisons, right? Mm. They've got fences around them. We've got military uh, people personnel. We've got, there. Yeah. We've got police um, there. We've got, you've got, um, uh, you know, health officials. You've got doctors and nurses on site. You've got a whole infrastructure around each of those hotels, which is why we can't use all of the hotels in the country, not because the hotels um, don't exist, but because uh, of the amount of resource that we need to put around each one of those. And every link in that chain, there is there are you know potential weaknesses that people can exploit. I just think no, if you no, get, if no you get one's one of arguing, those... James, though, that we should be cowboys. I just yeah, think yeah, we'd yeah. like to see a sense of a plan that slowly but surely and safely there's going to be some progress well, on we this are, we are, We're well, working well, towards it, but I, yeah. I mean, we've got to sit and make sure that our own borders are secure. Yeah. Just, we're, we're just a second. I mean, James, if it's all that bad, you know, why are we still letting people fly to the South Island? I mean, you know, we, we can't say that our strategy is zero risk. Good question. And the question is, well, <laughs> well, because because we know you're from Dunedin and we're hoping to go home, but... <laughs> <laughs> we're keeping but, the tone high today, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, but But seriously, though, I mean, you, you've got to have... a, a work out what your risk appetite is and then take make all decisions with the same appetite. David, right that, now, and that's fine for New Zealand, right, but when you're dealing yep. with the Pacific Islands... Okay, well, well the, other ones ask, the other ones, you know, it's their government that's asking for it. So, you know, let's respect independent foreign policy, not just for us. So the question is, is the risk appetite we've taken to this decision proportional to the risks we take elsewhere? And I think it's not, especially when you consider you know, the economic benefits for them mm -hmm. and also the geopolitical issue that we need to be wrapping our arms around our Pacific friends. I, I, disagree, else I, dis I disagree with you on risk. The risk might be small, but the consequences of that risk going, com coming home to roost are very, very large. What Same with South Island. What, about, uh, shush. what about Simon, Simon Bridges' point, sorry, sure, <laughs> with respect, shush. Uh, what about Simon Bridges' point about um, looking to other countries that have lower risk, so places like Taiwan or Vietnam? Could we be looking at travel bubbles with those places? Fletcher, you're nodding your head. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and in fact, uh, Taiwan was kind of first on my list. Uh, the minister's right. Uh, we were work, trying to work with Australia to make this happen initially. That's not going to work. We are now working with our realm countries. But just look at Papua New Guinea right now. Um, that started so small, and now it's just frightening how you know, that's uh, blown out. Um, and, and Port Moresby, uh, and probably you know up into the hill country, it's frightening. Um, if we do this, we have to make sure that we're investing on the other side of the equation in Nui, in the Cooks, yep. to make sure that if one case happens, we have the resource there and the talent to make sure we can lock that down. That, that's away. my point. We have to put our people over there as well as uh, on this side as well, right? To, in order to make sure that it's it's safe and secure and and. You know, we've got resource pressures here as well. And to your original question, yeah, I love Taiwan. So the sooner we can have a bubble there, that'd be great. All about Is it a country right? or an economy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Dr. Dr. Audrey Omua, the Deputy mm. Director General of the Pacific Community, said recently, and I'm paraphrasing, after 70 years of aid, our region is still in a state of chaos and crisis. David Seymour, has aid failed the Pacific? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I don't think it's failed just hasn't got what you expected. I mean, it's still made a difference, it's still positive. Um, and the other thing I'd say about aid that people always forget is a huge number of New Zealanders actually voluntarily give money and want to help people around the world, and I think that's a wonderful thing. And actually, if everyone signed up to a dollar a day, we'd be at 0.7. And um, I think we sometimes forget the efforts that people make, and if they're not all doing it, maybe they're trying to tell you something. I think the real purpose of aid whether it's succeeded or failed from a government point of view, is have we maintained stronger connections in our sphere of influence than anyone else? Uh, and that's where I think we're failing because a lot of our friends around the Pacific, you know, I was in Niue, same time as James last July, and um, I happened to go and talk to some people in their government, um, and they, they watched Dancing with the Stars, it turns out. Um, and, um, well, and, uh, <laughs> and they, they are besotted with China. They think they're going to get all their roads fixed and yeah. it's going to be hunky-dory. And that is, for me, clear evidence that we have failed uh, in Niue, and I suspect you get a similar story elsewhere. So we've got to do a lot more and a lot better because we're losing right now. So is, is that the reason we're only doing it soft power to 
to try and exert influence and, and make them talk about us more than China? Can no, you? not at all. And I reject that statement that because China's going in to uh, build the roads in Niue, somehow uh, we're not doing our part. I mean, you look at our aid program there and um, the airport is one massive example in the runway there. Um, actually, I went over there and the, um, oh, the rescue boat and, and all of the investment we make, we have a great relationship and it isn't because we hand over money. If you look at the Pacific Reset, it's about friendship and mutual understanding. Uh, I was in um, uh, Tahiti, I think it was, and one of the foreign ministers from Samoa was literally in tears on the Pacific Reset because of the change in the nature of the way that we have said yeah. we will engage. Lo lo lovely stuff, and I don't no, disagree. No, it's but, real. but end of the it's day... Real. You're, you're talking you're, about you're, relationships with people yeah. and countries. Yeah, well, and this is what it is. Yeah, yeah, lo it's lovely. getting ministers lo lovely. there, eyeballing people, yep. and engaging. And making them cry. But look, I mean, I mean look. <laughs> it was well, just your <laughs> dad was dancing with the stars. No, no, he hadn't seen it. But, but look, here's the problem, though. End of the day, um, they are, in my view, totally naively signing up to stuff that other Pacific Island nations have done and found themselves over a barrel. Uh, and as long as they are naively doing that, then we have failed. Can, oh, I, can I just make the peace between my two cabinet colleagues and the next <laughs> government? Um, it's, uh, it, it, oh, you will do it, dear. Be a quick phone call to Judith. Um, I think you'll be getting, you'll be getting a quick phone call. I actually think, you know, to, to get the peace breaking out here, I mean, aid, it seems to me, is bipartisan. I actually think if I look at what Winston yeah. has done in aid, I would go along with basically everything. I think it continues to, I say, what Murray McCulley did for him. Um, I think, can I just thank everyone in this room who gives a damn and who's involved in organisations that makes a massive uh, difference uh, in the area. I think, I think one of the things, possibly these two chaps on either side of me are, are debating a, uh, or, yeah. or, or, or are discussing is, look, I, I take a view that um, aid doesn't just need to be this pure thing about uh, the donor, actually we can have um, other things we can do well by doing good. And I think frankly, as we see the Pacific become more of a contested space, as it has its problems, and you all know what I'm talking about, frankly, um, it is only natural that we seek to do more in our neighbourhood uh, where we make the most difference. And actually in the areas that, again, I would say Winston's done a good job on continuing some of the things the last national led government did in renewables, and climate policy and mitigation on, and adaptation on that, uh, and the like. On that, according to the AUN survey, the top three priorities for people in all Pacific countries are jobs, health services and schools. Our last two governments offered infrastructure and now climate change mitigation. So who's driving the aid agenda, Russell, then? Well, th so I was talking to um, the uh, Cook Islands Finance Minister last year and they went through and analysed their budget over the last 10 years and worked out that approximately, I think it was 24% of their budget on, on average is committed to climate change uh, related, but largely adaptation issues to do with you know, the, the effects that it has every time a cyclone rolls through, they're in disaster relief territory. Um, and that's been growing uh, as a percentage of their national budget for, for some time. Um, and so when you talk about the things that you spend money on, you know, infrastructure, transport, energy, those are all things that are damaged badly every time that there is a, uh, every time there's a cyclone. So you can't disaggregate one from the other. They're, they are actually the same thing. And that is, that is something that the previous government did when they, um, what they call mainstreamed the, the climate change related aid into uh, everything that we do because climate change in the Pacific in particular, climate change affects everything. Uh, and, and so it just becomes part of the way that you approach every problem that you, that you deal with over there. I mean, imagine, imagine New Zealand having to spend a quarter of our you know, $100 billion budget annually on dealing with the effects of climate change. Well, we don't today, but you know, it could happen. <laughs> In the, in the, in the well, um, we need to move on to, to um, trade shortly, but just before we do, a video question from former MP in Vanuatu, Ralph Regin Vanu. So given the great success of the recognised seasonal employment scheme, which has brought benefits both to 
countries like Vanuatu and to New Zealand based on mutual needs and uh, abilities. Um, uh, what are your views on maintaining this uh, scheme and how, how it would, would it be done? Yeah. So, David Clark, to, to you, will you continue expand or cut the seasonal worker scheme post-COVID? Um, well, we're not proposing to cut it. Um, I think we've recently increased numbers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think we have to try and achieve co-benefits for uh, those who come. It's uh, good that we're, uh, we're trying to build qualifications and skills for those people whose labour's been utilised while they're in New Zealand. I also fear that we've got to be very careful that we don't create too much dependency on that income stream within uh, the Pacific Islands because technology will eventually replace those jobs and uh, it's probably only 10 or 20 no years away uh, and uh, I fear that if uh, we're not building the skill set of the people who are in those cohorts for the next 10 to 20 years to actually take skills back to the islands and grow their own economies that it won't be you know, that the cliff at the end of it will be pretty difficult for the Pacific Island countries. So if I wanted to see a change there, it would be to try and incorporate uh, training opportunities for those who are here. Yeah, look, Tova, can I just... I, I have constituents who are on the other side of the RSC scheme, and the frustration that they have with the administration of it, the fact that capping it means that quota, as they call it, for RSC workers is basically a valuable, tradable commodity has led to borderline corruption, which I know several investigative journals are looking at at the moment. Um, I, I love what David's saying, but right now you can't even administer the scheme as it is. And as for people's jobs being taken by technology in 20 years, it's probably true of most of us. It doesn't mean we should stop working now. Um, so look, I just take the view that REC scheme's essential. It's a really important geopolitical tool for co creating connections. We should be like Australia, we should lift the cap, we should give people multiple entry. Um, and if we did that, not only would it be very good for our horticultural and some other industries in New Zealand, uh, but it would strengthen our links, because right now it's just an absolute cluster uh, which has been dramatically worsened by COVID. I mean, cluster or not, it's this simple around my city of Tauranga. Um, the kiwi fruit won't get picked if there are no RSE workers. Mm. Yep. Um, so they are not a nice to have, they are essential. In yep. fact, even with the numbers that they are at the moment, I acknowledge they have been... Uh, increase. Uh, there is still a lot of kiwi fruit um, that will not get picked. And Absolutely. by the way, that's what's yep. along with other uh, primary produce getting us through this. Um, yep. I can remember being in the cabinet, uh, the last government, and there were very strong debates about REC. And bluntly, they came down to where the unemployment level was at. So, as unemployment, uh, if it was going up, um, there would be strong arguments, I suppose, from the hawks saying, well, you can't have so many REC workers because we need those jobs for the unemployed and so on and so forth. Um, but in general terms, the, the blunt truth is in the Hawke's Bay, in Nelson, in Central Otago, yep. in the Bay of Plenty, but, we yeah. need those RSC but, 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 workers, but, but, and they but, love it too. But Simon, looking at time employment is a mistake, because I can tell you from the employer's point of view, they do not get the substitution. WINS actually support their applications because people won't do the jobs. And it's not just those jobs that matter. There's been substitution it's all the, it's all the pack out. It's all the pack out. Of tourism. Well, it's very and, limited, David. I can tell you from the people and they got trying an to do it. Left. It's very limited. And it's actually all the other jobs in the pack house, the administration, the marketing, the distribution that are in danger when they mow that fruit into the ground. So, you know, this has got to be done far better for domestic economic reasons and for geopolitical no, reasons. You, okay, you no, sorry, yeah. we need to move on to trade. Global trade was in trouble before COVID-19. Now it is on life support. Simon, because you were so keen to talk just then, why don't you start with us? We joined forces with other countries to defend the global trading system before COVID-19. Is that still our role? Yeah, it is. I mean, I think, uh, look, David's made the point, I'd, I'd suggest we all agree, we've got a stressed international order. I mean, we've got a situation where whether it's um, the WHO or the WTO, uh, there are problems and, uh, and we're trying to find our way through those. Um, New Zealand, uh, awful phrase, used far too often in foreign affairs, but does punch above its weight. You know, we are respected in this area. I, I think well. we're all of those no, things. You got, you got it. But so, so we need to sort of get out there. I mean, I just, I just think actually trade is relatively simple on this panel. It, at least it is when Labor's in government. Um, we all believe in it. Um, we, we, we all want to do uh, more comprehensive deals that are in our interests, um, and actually want to pro promote it, um, not just bilaterally, multilaterally, 
and in the international order. COVID has also revealed our complacency on trade. We haven't had an effective plan to turbocharge exports for decades. We've failed to execute a strategy that prioritises value over volume. David Seymour, what's going to be different now? Well, I think what's going to be different is, frankly, we've got to find a whole lot more people to sell milk powder to or a whole lot of new stuff to sell. We, we must diversify. And you can either pull back from relationships that you're uncomfortable with, and, and I think a lot of businesses are already doing that. When you talk to business leaders, they say, look, we see what's coming, we're diversifying. I think it's important politicians give clear signalling that, that, you know, that may be the right thing to do. Uh, and then I think ultimately you've got a whole lot of other domestic economic policy that I won't uh, go into, but what we can do internationally is start actually further liberalising our links uh, with people that we do want to share uh, values with. And I would say, you know, we should have um, you know, investment green lanes with democratic OECD countries and third powers, as someone said earlier. Uh, we should say, actually, you know, if your investment originates in such a country, uh, we have shared values and we're going to get rid of a lot of the OIO bureaucracy that just makes it really hard to send New Zealanders money. Uh, sure. So you know, that's, that's the kind of liberalisation that we need. It's value-based and it'll actually strengthen our links rather than pulling back. Thoughts? One of the, well, many. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I'm worried about at the moment is actually the effect of COVID on the kind of human interactions that, it, that facilitate those kinds of conversations and, and trade links. So you, you, you've seen two things happen uh, in trade. We've well, seen many, many things happen, but two of the things that we've seen happen is um, actually, interestingly, the high value end of our volume to value strategy has taken a bit of a hit, and it's actually at the commodity end where a, a lot of the um, a lot of the trade uh, volumes are at the moment, um, and uh, that makes me reflect. I mean, I, I'm I'm all for in every single industry that we've got moving from volume to value. I think that's absolutely the right strategy, but also you do need to maintain uh, the kind of plan B for situations like this. The other thing uh, is that um, I, I do think that there is a, a, a real potential. I mean, Zoom's great to a point, but there, there is potential here for the, those kinds of networks to start to degrade over the course of the next uh, 18 months um, or so because we are constrained in terms of our travel. So we've got trade in physical goods and in weightless uh, exports. Um, but we don't have the free movement of people in the way that in the way that we've kind of gotten used to, and it is astonishing the immediacy of the effect uh, of that back into uh, back into our trade relationships. Uh, what about what about tourism? What's the plan for tourism beyond short-term bailouts? Does this offer a chance for us to, to revitalise and, and reimagine the, the sector, Victor? Yes, it does. You just need to talk to the industry themselves. The um, conversations about that moving forward sustainably um, and I mean ideally uh, what we were trying to do was get that bubble with Australia I mean it constitutes almost 70 percent of our international inbound tourism and um, you know they spend reasonably well um, unfortunately uh, through no fault of our own that's not really an option right now so in terms of tourism uh, I know that this is foreign affairs but in terms of tourism the dollars being pivoted by um, Tourism New Zealand to get New Zealanders out and about, and to a large extent that's working, but it's not going to be sufficient forever. So we've had this conversation about bubbles. That's absolutely the way. Tova, forward. can I jump in on this? So yeah. this is a uh, there's a really uh, having just talked about the the volume to value strategy. Tourism was one of those ones where up until recently we were really struggling with volume uh, and not value, and trying to trying to move things further up the chain. I mean there is a lot of very high value offerings in New Zealand, but you know, as everybody knows from the stories about Freedom Campers and so on, that there are issues to do with the low value volume end of, of, the, of the industry. Now of course we have neither volume nor value, but uh, there may be an opening during the COVID period where actually a really high value proposition could open up, where people, you, you say to um, you know, high net worth individuals who are interested in spending some time here, and apparently there are quite a lot of them right now, um, that if they are um, willing to spend two weeks in a quarantine hotel first, full expense, uh, on their own ticket, um, then essentially have slow tourism within New Zealand, so people would be coming for longer trips, that you might see a, uh, a sort of a revitalisation at the, at the very high end, which you could then build on as 
the world kind of calms down. We should just down. do it. Great, yeah, welcome. Now. Yeah, yeah, we don't, come, we come don't, have, we don't here, have room <laughs> enough for returning Kiwis at this stage, so I'm not sure yeah, yeah, yeah. that seems a little bit well, further down Well, the road. issue, no, so, so that, no, you've got to phase things, right? So we do have issues with, um, we want to make sure that New Zealanders who uh, have been caught out and are losing their visas and so on are able to return home. Uh, and, and there is an issue because we're constrained in terms of the numbers of people we can quarantine at any one time. When you've got thousands of New Zealanders returning home, do you say to some of those people, I'm sorry, we're going to set aside a portion of the quota and say, New Zealanders, I'm sorry, you can't come home because we're living through a rich American. <laughs> it's not going to go down that well. What about international no. students, Minister Parker, another big export earner? Why kill a $5 billion industry? Why not start prioritising them and quarantining them? We, we haven't killed it. COVID has. You know, so don't, don't, don't blame the government for that. You know, international... Uh, um, uh, travel connections were effectively. Why can't they quarantine here? Yeah. Why can't um, you extend the capacity and allow them to quarantine here and revitalise that industry? Well, the the biggest thing to overcome there is the quality of the uh, isolation requirements, and as they found in Australia, with due respect, and we found in New Zealand until we had a very strict government control of that, contracting it out hasn't worked. And there's limited ability of the, to do everyone at once. Can I just say something about trade uh, more generally? I think there are two parts to this. One is you've got to give more support to your exporters in country, uh, uh, particularly medium-sized exporters, because they can't travel. They're more reliant upon government intermediaries who've got presence in market, and so we've we've doubled support for that. Uh, but in respect of the, uh, the uh, trade access issues, which aren't the be-all and end-all, but they, they remain important, you've got to keep hope alive, and you've got to keep fighting, and you've got to be taking things to the, work, to the world that maintain your own relevance so that you're heard, and in respect of these other opportunities, when they are ready to drop, you've actually got some, um, some capital, I suppose, of some kind in the bank with them. Um, that's why we project these new agreements, like the agreement on climate change trade and and sustainability or the digital economic partnership agreement. We try and take them out to the world, both to take things to the multilateral system eventually, but also to burn us our own negotiation. The final thing I do disagree with, with, um, with Simon and David on this, I think one of the reasons why trade has uh, you've got rising protectionist, protectionism in the world is that for a lot of people, trade hasn't worked for their own interests. And there are lots of answers to that. Some of them lie in social systems, not trade policy, but part of it lies in investment policy. The reason why we have forged a stronger consensus in favour of trade is because we banned one percenters from overseas outbidding New Zealanders for existing homes. And that is, it, uh, I know that to be true, David, you might sniff at that, but for the vast majority of people... Your chronology is 30 years out, but otherwise... No, yeah. no, it's not actually. It's happened in the last three years, and you're, you're, if you were elected and National were elected, you would undo that policy, and you would put at risk the social consensus that we have reforged with the New Zealand population, that trade is there in their interest because you confuse trade with investment. That is not to say that foreign direct investment is not important. It is, but you can be more discerning than say we will take all investment into all asset classes, and that's what we've done. David Seymour, are trade deals benefiting the poorest New Zealanders? Well, absolutely. I mean, you, you why, have to go why back. are they still you poor? Why, why are they still poor? Well, the, the, compared with 40 years ago, I mean, have you driven a Ford Escort recently? Have you seen videos of what sort of clothes people wore? I mean, have you seen the state of electronics, entertainment, communication? I mean, are you, are you seriously saying... David, that, David, yeah. we're in Wellington Central, yeah. mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, are you... The old classic no, no, no. Ford Escort. It works in Tauranga, but don't try there's here. Some, there's, some, there's some... Don't the worry, Simon. Is showing Simon, down. There's, there's some thinking people here, and I'm talking to them. So, <laughs> so, so I mean, you know, you really want to get down to it. Um, the reason that people have had challenges in the last 40 years is because the poorest quintile of households used to spend a quarter of their money on housing, now they're spending a half. Uh, and that's not because we have foreign investment, it's because we made it almost impossible to build one. So, you know, that, that's your issue. But, but it's not, it's not globalisation. Globalisation has been a massive opportunity for all New Zealanders. Do you know what, though, and I accept David's point as far as this, what David's point as far as it goes, that access is only part of it. But actually, in terms of the pure trade agreement stuff, I doubt there is much disagreement around this group. You know what, we want EU, we want UK, we want ASEP, we want India, 
We want a China upgrade. Yes, we do. We want um, we some want, of us. We want, want diversity. US. We want diversity. Yeah. But the aims are pretty simple. We want goods. We want services. We want non-tariff barriers done over, and we want that diversification. And like we will all agree with that. It's fundamentally how you do it. I, I think one of the most fascinating things that I still haven't got my head around. And I'm going to think more about it. Um, uh, well, in between door knock and various other worthy things I'll do over the next couple of months, More but pictures, is, is the point James making, which is around, I think, and these guys will want to come back on it, but if I can caricature it slightly, prior to COVID, they were, they were giving you a story about how they were worried about farming and we needed to do something and it was all no good. Now you won't hear a bad word about primary production from anyone in the government. They love it. And I'm sitting there in the ridiculous position saying I disagreed with them before and I still disagree with them. Because I don't think there's enough focus actually being put, David uh, and James, on, um, on high value, on services. Services are going great guns with the likes of the United States. That's where we should be pushing right now. That before COVID, trade was more politicised. Well, there aren't so many trade barriers around those services, so I'm not sure your point there. And there's no blocking of our services going into the US, so new oh, trade agreements not going on the services. So. On, on the con consensus, before COVID, or despite the consensus, before COVID, trade was becoming more politicised than ever. The, the far left and the populist right uh, were agreeing that um, you know, they were anti-TPP, pro-subsidies, anti-establishment, anti-globalisation. Minister Parker, will COVID act as a breaker and accelerant to those trends, do you think? Uh, probably an accelerant. Um, you know, we're doing our best to, to push against those things, including through CPTPP. I had a meeting, you know, the annual meeting on that by Zoom call today. Um, but, yeah, I think the forces of protectionism are on the rise in the world, and they have been for a number of years, and this will accelerate it. I think there is a proper area where we can agree with people. I think people were feeling very insecure through the collapse of supply lines on PPE, the shortage of um, you know, DNA or RNA test, test kits for those sorts of things. It's already enabled under WTO rules to actually have local production for those sort of public health reasons. And I think we have to allow voice to be given to those insecurities and that they're proper insecurities because there was some pretty selfish behaviour in respect of some countries. Having said that, international supply lines, even in the face of collapsing airlines, have actually held up remarkably well on global value chains. So we ought not to let that debate go so far as to, to go to, you know, to, to extremes. But I think in order to take people with you and avoid those extremes, you have to acknowledge what are proper insecurities about some basic things like, I'm actually really pleased that we've got a local mask manufacturer in New Zealand. It's helped. Fletcher Tabata, I know you've got um, only two minutes, I think, before you've got a boost to catch your plane. So um, before you go, what's best or realistic now, multilateral or bilateral trade deals? I think the bilateral ones will be easier. I mean, uh, it just takes away so much complexity in terms of negotiation. Um, ideally, uh, you know, the US, for example, uh, would, would walk the road down a bilateral conversation. But if we can encourage them to come into the TPP, there's an outcome uh, that I think everyone on the stage uh, would agree on. Although, to be fair, there's going to be some amazing uh, negotiation going on on how we uh, rephrase um, some of the, uh, the terms. Yeah. All right, thank you. You may be excused. I thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, everyone. <laughs>
uh, trade and environmental goods and services. Help me out here, David. There's two others. Um, uh, environmental marketing uh, labels. Yeah, that's right. Making them real. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so having some, some kind of common standards around language, around those sort of things. So it's quite a tight agreement. Uh, you'll probably laugh when I say this, but it actually started in, it started in the same way that the TPP got, got started, which is with a small group of countries with whom we have very low states trade relationships. In other words, it's much easier for us to develop a rule set. So we're negotiating uh, with Norway, Iceland, Fiji and Costa Rica. Um, and the and, idea in Switzerland, now. in Switzerland, sorry, yeah. And the idea is that between you know, we have low trade vol volumes with all of those uh, countries, but the idea is that we would um, uh, form that agreement and then essentially invite other countries to join. And we've already had quite a lot of interest from some major players uh, who have sort of said, "Well, can you hurry along, please? Because we would quite like to to get in there, and then you can build on on from that." And that that would be a, that would be a world first. It would be a real breakthrough and the whole field of trade negotiations because it deliberately brings and links our environmental commitments with our, with our trade commitments. And personally, um, and I, I believe that we're not going to be able to achieve anything uh, like we, what we need to do in the domain of climate change and the Paris Agreement without explicitly setting up trade relationships that enhance the outcomes that we're aiming for. So the idea that um, if, if, you know, we're an importer of vehicles, right? We don't manufacture any of our own vehicles. So um, we, we need to be able to have trade relationships where we, we can facilitate the import of, of electric vehicles. And we know that we've actually had a couple of um, deals fall over because as a small buyer, um, you know, manufacturers have tended to preference other countries. So can we use our trade relationships to drive those sort of things? We have had um, some success in um, our agricultural sector in terms of the efficiency of the emissions output um, per unit of production. Uh, and there's a, an increasing amount of intellectual property that's being developed there. That gives us something to offer to other food producing countries in, in the world as well. We're actually not going to be able to achieve our climate outcomes without solid trade relationships. And so I think that that agreement, um, when it gets over the line, will be the genesis of, those, of a whole new generation of of uh, trade agreements. That was a very comprehensive answer to naming one trade I've deal been that, you, <laughs> that you like. David Parker, you talked before about um, having a, a Zoom meeting um, for your annual annual CTP. I can never say that. Yeah. You add too many letters. Comprehensive uh, and comp progressive. Comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. Trans -Pacific partnership. <laughs> um, are our trade deals going to be negotiated digitally from now on? And what are the what are the problems with that? Um, well, you, you speak to our trade negotiators who are more expert at this than, than I am. So you'll be speaking uh, to them a fair bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they would say that um, some things actually move faster, but the hard end of it, it's hard to land. So some of, uh, there, were, there was one, and I won't say which one, but there was there actually more than one negotiation that actually moved surprisingly fast during COVID because it was more efficiently done via Zoom meetings. but. You know, there is a disadvantage in not being able to uh, do as Simon suggested, which is go and knock on doors and form, form the sorts of relationships and also at a negotiator level actually sit in a room and sort through the last uh, um, more difficult issues. So, you know, that is dis disadvantageous, but um, you've just got to deal with what you've got to deal with. Do you want to pick up, Simon, on what trade deals we can hope to, talked about it a bit before, but what trade deals we can hope to get across the line post-COVID? Yeah, I mean, look, I think if we, if we had a top priority, I, I, I would think David would agree with this, um, it would be the EU uh, FTA. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's both in terms of achievability and time frame, uh, and also what we do for New Zealand. Um, I think um, Your Excellency's in the third row there, row there, it does have to be high quality and comprehensive. Um, that, that's really important, but it will also achieve other objectives. And you know, I, I, I broadly um, go along with what James has said. You know, there are other significant objectives, whether it's climate. Um, I, I think whether it's bluntly as a rationale, a geopolitical deeper relationship, in the sense that we should be working more closely uh, with countries we like-minded with. Can I just add something to that and to what James said? I think it's unrealistic to expect trade agreements to have uh, obligations that the climate agreements can't themselves negotiate. Now, I've always found it slightly inconsistent for people to say that trade agreements should have all of these things to achieve climate outcomes, which I think they should actually help, but 
to expect them to have compulsory agreements, country to country agreeing to climate commitments, when you can't get that out of the Paris Accord or the predecessor Kyoto Protocol, is with respect unrealistic. And, well, and I think, and so also just to, avoid, to not create a diplomatic spat here, but I, I tell you what, it does intrigue me is that we with the United Kingdom are doing all of this yeah. and we're going to go down this track and I go along with that but by the way they're negotiating one with Australia and my cursory glance of it is none of that stuff's there mm. so it's kind of mm. like if we're going to do that um, I'd kind of like some of our friends to be doing the same mm. I would too which is Can probably why the X agreement that I do agree with James on is, is an important contribution yeah. to the world I th just on, the, on this point that David just made about um, the, the inability to uh, get the international community to create binding agreements around climate change um, is that's the question that you posed over about multilateralism um, versus uh, bilateralism or um, you know, plurilateralism so that so I, I actually think that the Paris Agreement will evolve uh, to be more like the WTO where you've got a, a sort of a high level framework it's not very a, helpful, a, is it? well <laughs> only because bloody Americans won't fund the um, Anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Any Americans and, in there? And I thought it was a, uh, and I thought it was a diplomatic incident with China we were going to create. Yeah. Right. Right. I think it's really important that we critique our friends even-handedly. Um, so <laughs> I think I'm sorry, um, but we need to go to the okay. audience questions now. Yeah, Josie's right. going to come up with. Is there? A... We've got about. Uh, we've taken the three most popular questions, so I'll ask them all so we don't run out of time. Um, and some are directed specifically to one of the speakers. So, one for you, Simon, uh, from Charles Finney. Would a would a national-led government be prepared to advocate publicly on issues such as Taiwan's observership of the World Health Assembly? That's one question. Second one from Oxfam. Will you commit, any of you, to doubling funding for climate mitigation and adaptation in the Pacific? Um, and the third question that's come up popular, how do we leverage our hosting of APEC in 2021? So, sorry, am I asking or answering? Yeah, yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the basic answer is uh, yes. Thanks for the easy one, Charles. Um, Taiwan's a, um, a minefield for the un uninitiated. I, I think the simple position on Taiwan for a, a national government would be we uh, accept and respect the one China policy um, but what is also true is we have seen a change relatively recently uh, where a China has been more assertive and frankly aggressive in relation to Taiwan uh, and that deeply concerns us and the extent that it goes further we would contend that um, we, we I think want to be broadly supportive uh, of, of Taiwan it's a great economy. Uh, we do a huge amount with it, uh, and we share common values. The second one was Oxfam um, wanting to know whether you would double funding uh, funding for climate mitigation in the Pacific. I, I mean, firstly, I think every party on the stage would have the aspiration to fund more, right? Um, there's there's no doubt about that. I think the second point is though, look. It, I think what is also true, possibly with the exception of the Greens, James, you can make an election commitment here tonight, um, none of us responsibly are going to do that. Um, and that is simply because uh, we're balancing those things against domestic uh, factors. And I think what, what is also true is in terms of the social licence that New Zealanders have when it comes to aid, funding is really important, the amount is really important, but accountability and make sure the results are there is also crucially important. James Shaw, would you like to make that commitment to double funding for aid in the Pacific? Well, our government's increased it by 50%. So I know that that's not double, but it's a pretty significant increase uh, in, in funding. Would we if we had the opportunity? Of course. But, you know, Simon's right. It's very difficult to make those commitments, particularly at the moment when government finances are, um, shall we say, in flux. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I think the principle is... Understatement. No, the, yeah, the principle... Um, would stand though, and I think Fletcher made this point earlier, that it's really important in times like this that we don't retreat from our international commitments because it's critically important that we continue to support and, and actually increase the support that we have um, for our uh, uh, neighbours in the Pacific because the um, risks to them are in, in terms of scale are orders of magnitude greater than they are to us. Um, and, and so, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say double, but I'm, I, I will say that you know we would certainly do, do everything we, that we can. 
And um, David Pike, did you want to take that final question about leveraging APEC? Um, can I just say some, something briefly on aid first? Um, uh, I agree with the point that's been made that we've had a 50% increase in aid um, budgets, which is, uh, I think, reasonably impressive after they went down under the last government. So we were more about than three hundred and ninety to just under seven hundred by who's yeah, yeah. But so you know there's a difference between aspiration, well, I knew that was aspiration and delivery. <laughs> well that's right, I got the numbers out because I thought it would be quite good to poke you with them. <laughs> uh, uh, um, in, 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 res in respect of um, I was, there was a point I didn't have the opportunity to make around aid in the Pacific. I was in the Pacific recently and one of the things that New Zealand does better than a lot of other areas, and this isn't so much an adaptation issue as a mitigation issue, but a lot of the large donors, including some of the, uh, the Asian Development Bank and some of the European projects that are funded in the Pacific, have contracting rules that close out local delivery by Pacific country participants. So for example, there is capability in the delivery of PV projects to islands in the Pacific. But the locals aren't ever picked because they don't have big enough turnover to meet the minimum turnover thresholds of the overseas donor nations outside of New Zealand. Uh, and, uh, and that's something that we do do better, and it's also something that we try to use our influence on in order to, to do, you know, get other countries to help as well. Uh, sorry, APEC. Mm. Um, well, uh, you know, a Zoom pick. Well, you know, there, you know there, is, there is a chance that we could time this quite well. Um, it is harder to do things on Zoom than it is face to face, but Apex had three difficult years in a row, and we thought it was our responsibility to try and do as good as anyone can do in the difficult situation. You have to take these calls early in terms of whether you Zoom it or whether you do things physically, because you actually spend so much money in advance on security issues for visiting leaders, to be honest. Uh, and so we've taken that call, um, uh, what will reflect both met best on us is if we actually deliver a credible year and we actually have some positive outcomes in support of multilateral institutions. And it may well be, depending on election outcomes in different parts of the world, that we actually strike a moment in time where we can actually cause the system through APEC to move forward rather than just be becalmed or moving backwards. Okay, I think that's a, um, a good place to leave it. Thank you very much to all of our participants. Thank you all for being here this evening as well. I think we've had some um, consensus, a lot of dissension, um, some clarity, a bit more confusion on some, on some issues. Now that Fletcher's gone, we've probably got the more likely makeup of the parliament on the stage. Um, <laughs> based on the current polling, and there's, you know, it's political... Um, which is the most not accurate? To, not, ours is the most accurate. Yeah, right. Definitely uh, a lot less rogue than yours. Um, <laughs> but never, as James Shaw has said oft times, never write off Winston Peters. Um, but thank you very much to all of our participants and thank you very much to all of you um, for joining us this evening. The election campaign is now officially, unofficially on. <laughs>